Hey everybody! So just as an FYI, today's episode we'll be talking about Silent Hill. Uh, Silent Hill is a game that does have some content warnings that we wanted to let everyone know about. Particularly the game does have some uh, graphic imagery and uh, other things that might make people uncomfortable if you want to go and play the game yourself. So just as a heads up, that's what we're talking about today and uh, we just want to make sure that everyone's aware and if you don't feel comfortable uh, listening to this episode, feel free to skip it and uh, you can either go back and listen to another episode Episode, or we will have a great episode for you next week. Enjoy the episode. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Seth. And I'm Zach. And we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. Yeah, we are. That's right. We. That's, that's right. We, uh, that's right. That's who we are. Hey, Seth, next next week. No. Oh, yeah. The week, the week after next week, we'll be, at, we'll be at PAX. We'll be at PAX soon. Wow, yeah. It'll be the first time I've seen you in person and, well, since today. Last time we went to PAX, we went together, and that was in 2020. Mm-hmm. And then there was no 2021 PAX, but there will be a 2022 PAX. That's right. So it'll be pretty exciting that we'll be going. We'll be going on Saturday and Sunday, in case anyone is yeah. curious. We'll bop around the big city of Boston. We're going to go with Dunkin' Donuts, and then we're going to go to the PAX, and then we're going to go... We may go to South Street Diner. We'll have a good time. We'll have a good we'll time. We'll have a good time. You'll all be jelly. We'll put some stuff on Instagram. Maybe we'll even shoot some footage of us at yeah, the convention. Yeah, we might. Maybe... I don't want to make any promises. <laughs> but no promises. We'll, we'll definitely have an episode on that Sunday for you. Yes, that's we always will have an episode on a Sunday. But anyway, Seth, what have you been recently playing? So recently I've been playing a game called Kirby and the Forgotten Land, which oh. was a byway pass of mine. And I think I said that it was going to be a... Well, you told me about it and then I then bought it. Kirby and the Forgotten Land is a 2022 uh, platform video game developed by HAL Laboratory, which is the standard developer for Kirby. There were a few Kirby games that were not developed by HAL Laboratory, but uh, primarily HAL is the Kirby team. And it was published by Nintendo for the Nintendo Switch. It is the 17th mainline installment in the Kirby series, which, fun fact, is a series that I don't think Zach and I have ever talked about. I think we briefly talked about Oh, we, we did when we talked about mascots. Back in the Dark Ages, we talked about um, Kirby and the mascot episode i think like episode it's got to be in the 30s maybe 40s regardless it's not this episode and it is the first time in the kirby mainline installment that's in 3d mm. i have been enjoying it a great deal it's a lot of fun kind of plays like mario except you're kirby oh that's fun yeah so if you like mario platformers you'll probably like this game it's not too particularly hard as most kirby games aren't particularly hard because kirby is overpowered like kirby is probably the most overpowered nintendo character period he can fly he could just suck up people instantly killing them and he can take their powers using their powers to kill people more and in this version of the game i don't know if it's the first time that you can do it i haven't played a, i've played a lot of kirby but i haven't played a lot of recent kirby beyond this Kirby game. You can do a, like a, I don't know, like a big suck, I guess. I don't. <laughs> uh, Kirby I don't... and the big suck. Kirby <laughs> and the big suck. You can like <laughs> put, Kirby can like mouth things that are. You're just not making this any better. <laughs> that are bigger than normal. So like there's a car and Kirby can like be come the car okay okay i see what you're saying so you could suck up like your like traditional bad guys and have like a firepower but then you could go to a car and you can suck that and become a 
car, but you don't lose your firepower, but you don't get to use your firepower when you're the car, if that makes sense. Right. Like you can okay, get, okay. When you, okay. Can, you, when you release the car, you're still a fire Kirby, but you can't shoot fire while you're a car. You can b- turbo blast as a car, though, so you can go super fast. So it's kind of like an open world-ish game. You travel from stage to stage, kind of like in a Mario game. So I'm in the beginning, so I'm doing the stages in order. But as more stuff opens up, I think you can kind of pick and choose where you go. And then each of the stages, uh, you drop in and you have to find these creatures. Uh, you have to find them. They're lost. And there is a set number per stage that are hidden. And then there's like the final three that are at the end. And you collect them. And then you send them back to their village. And they build more of the village. And you need to collect more of them. And throughout the game, you can also have like hidden challenges to do as well. Like uh, eating fruit off of stumps. And finding the roses and stuff like that. And lighting lanterns. Just like various different challenges. And some challenges that are hidden that you discover by playing through it and exploring each of the worlds there are sometimes bosses and then there is also situations that you need to try and figure out how to get around them kind of like in a kirby's kind of like a puzzle game in that regard so it's like a puzzle platformer but yeah it's been a lot of fun it's really enjoyable you're you're collecting stars which i mean kirby's always kind of collected stars but i just it really also kind of feels like it has mario vibes for sure so zach what have uh, you been playing recently well i've been playing something speaking of mario vibes uh, i've been playing super mario brothers 3 oh what well, nintendo's got our uh, got our attention this week yeah uh so super mario brothers 3 is the third mario brothers game as you might expect uh it originally came out in 1988 and was actually originally i believe announced via the movie the wizard which we're due for an episode on video game movies but specifically the wizard the wizard is a really weird video game movie it's like a 90 minute long commercial for nintendo products but super mario brothers 3 is arguably one of my favorite mario brothers games it's like a tie between mario world and super mario brothers 3 for me i just feel like it's like the game that has the controls to like near perfection i think why super mario brothers world takes the number one slot is because it takes the fine-tuned controls of super mario brothers 3 and just tweaks them that much more so that they're even better but like i feel like you can do so much in super mario brothers 3 and i always have a good time playing that game but it really does improve upon so much what mario brothers 1 and 2 did that it just makes it such a fun game and i also love finding all the secrets in the game or at least the secrets that i've been able to find like there's uh, there's a hidden little like secret in the first castle where if you fly up over the level you'll get into a doorway and then you can get a flute and if you play the flute you can jump worlds so you can go to one of the later parts of the game i always found that cool especially as a kid discovering those type of secrets yeah i like it in the um super mario bros the original you can like in the second stage world one dash two you can go up and above and go into like the pipes yeah, that bring you to yeah, stage yeah. like three four yeah i could play that in the back of my cell phone case not on my cell phone on the case yes yeah well today we're talking about a game that is dramatically tonally different than super mario brothers or kirby especially especially kirby it's like the right. polar opposite of kirby i think right. like kirby's this happy fun go lucky game and today we're talking about silent hill seth do you have any memories of silent hill is silent hill the one with pyramid head yes it is well that's silent hill too Ah, I do have memories of Silent Hill. I think some of our extended family owned Silent Hill for the PlayStation, and I saw them play it. I personally didn't play silent hill until i was in college but when i was younger when i was in middle school and high school i learned about silent hill and it became kind of this like taboo thing for me like it just seemed spooky and scary and i knew if i played it i was going to get scared so i like to read about it but i never played it until i was older and less scared so me and scary games have like this relationship where sometimes i like playing scary games i enjoy scary games more if i am with people because i don't get as scared like when i'm by myself sometimes i'll play a scary game and then i'll be like why am i playing this game it's scaring me and then i'll just play a game that's not scary but when i'm with other people i i think it's fun to play scary games uh especially like multiplayer scary games i've played a lot of a little of scary games if that makes sense i've played a lot of scary games but i played very little of them all but i haven't played much of silent hill 
but I've probably watched more Silent Hill than played it. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I definitely have seen a lot of gameplay footage of the other Silent Hills. I, I have played through most of the first game, and I've started the second game, but I haven't gotten to that far in it. Uh, but mostly because it's a game that takes a lot of time, so I just I haven't really had time to sit down and play it. One of these days, though, I, I will finish Silent Hill 2. I have played a good amount of Silent Hill 1. But to get into the history of Silent Hill, the, the game began production in September of 1996. Development was done by a group called Team Silent at Konami's Tokyo Studio. Now, Team Silent, despite what the name might sound like, wasn't a single group. It was rather multiple development teams that existed throughout Konami's history. These teams consisted of game developers who all had failed projects. Their director for the first game was Kichiro Toyama, who had previously worked on the game's Snatcher in 1994 in International Track and Field in 1996, which were moderately successful games. But I think when I say that these developers had failed projects were between the games that they might have had that did come out, they were coming up with all these other ideas that were just never hitting the mark. And Konami essentially put together Team Silent as a way of giving these people something to do because they were not putting out products that were selling. Now, the goal of Silent Hill was to create a game that would do well in the U.S. market, um, which I think was a similar goal that Capcom had when they were looking to make Resident Evil. Konami had wanted the game to have a Hollywood-like atmosphere, which is also something Capcom wanted with Resident Evil. So I think Konami really just wanted to make Resident Evil. <laughs> so Konami put together the original Team Silent using some of the developers who had intended to leave Konami, largely due to issues they were having having with their own projects and inability to work with other teams. Konami also was not really sure the best way to make this game, and they actually lost faith in the development, and this allowed Team Silent to work without being confined to Konami's restrictions. So they decided to ignore Konami's idea of a Hollywood atmosphere quote-unquote game and make the game centered on the player's emotions. The idea of focusing on the player's emotions meant that they were going to tap into something that players could strongly react to. Fear. They began designing the world around the idea of fear of the unknown, with the overall plot designed to be vague and inconsistent. Director Toyama wasn't a big fan of horror, but he did have interest in movies by David Lynch and The Occult, both of which are heavy influences in the world of Silent Hill and the lore. Other inspirations, such as the idea of a town called Silent Hill, were largely based on influences from Western movies and books. One example is the school in Silent Hill seems to be directly based on the school for featured in the 1990 film Kindergarten Cop, uh, to the point where some of the posters you see in the background of Kindergarten Cop appear in Silent Hill. Uh, the characters within the game were designed by Taka Yoshi Sato, who was actually a relatively new young hire at Konami at the time. In fact, I found his resume online, and uh, this was one of his second or third jobs within going out his resume had sale information so that's why i was looking at it but anyway <laughs> yeah seth wasn't looking to hire him <laughs> maybe i was though he was initially not credited on the work that he did because he was really assisting older staff members with 3d modeling for other projects he then reportedly threatened konami management with withholding technical information on how he created a 3d demo movie if they did not assign him to do 3d work so due to that threat they said why don't you go design things for silent hill which it feels like if you haven't gotten that, Silent Hill was where Konami put people that were troublemakers. <laughs> yeah. They were like, go work on Silent Hill. The creatures and puzzles in the game were primarily based on various classical novels, such as The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. This was done to tie into the plot with one of the central characters, Alessa, being portrayed as a child who enjoys these books. Other characters in the game had their names chosen based on famous individuals, uh, uh, Cheryl Mason came from the actress Cheryl Lee. Lisa Garland came from Judy Garland. And Michael Kaufman's name came from Michael Hertz and Lloyd Kaufman of Troma Studios. Other items that appeared in the game are pulled from various religious and spiritual belief systems. For example, the Seal of Metatron and the Seal of Samael are references to the angels Metatron and Samael, both featured in the Jewish Talmud. There are also a reference to Laros, who is a demon featured in the Lesser Key of Solomon, a 17th century grimoire. You can also encounter the names Ophelio, Haggith, Phaleg, and Bathor, 
which reference angels featured in the Book of Ceremonial Magic, an 1898 grimoire written by the occultist Arthur Edward Waite. A demo of the game was shown off at the 1998 Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3, in Georgia. Uh, the presentation largely consisted of in-game footage and CGI cutscenes. Konami was actually pleasantly surprised by the positive reaction that the audience had. Uh, they were applauding during some of the presentation, and they decided to assign more personnel to the team, along with money to boost the PR. Despite the increase in personnel, certain design choices were made to the game to account for the PlayStation's hardware. One of these design choices was introducing a layer of fog over the game's world to hide limited render distance. This is also why the game is primarily set at night, to better mask the graphics that may not have been the best of quality. Silent Hill was ultimately released in February of 1999 in North America, March of 1999 in Japan, and July of 1999 in Europe. Now, to talk about more of the gameplay and the story of Silent Hill, Silent Hill is a psychological horror game. The game plays in a similar manner to Resident Evil, being set in third-person view with a mostly fixed camera. Silent Hill takes place in the fictional resort town of Silent Hill, Maine. The game begins with Harry Mason and his adopted daughter Cheryl. Both are traveling to a town of Silent Hill to take a vacation, as that's where his daughter wanted him to go. Yeah, she literally is like, bring me to Silent Hill. And he's like, okay. <laughs> How old is she? She's young. She's like, she's supposed to be probably, I think, only like, she's like younger than being a teenager. After some issues with the car, Harry and Cheryl arrive at night and Harry nearly hits a girl standing in the center of the street. He swerves out of the way and crashes the car, knocking him out. And that's why you don't listen to kids on vacation advice. When Harry awakens, he notices that Cheryl has vanished and has begun to snow. He ventures into the town of Silent Hill, hoping to speak to someone and find his missing daughter. However, the town is silent and empty. As he walks through the town, he hears a siren, and the world around him begins to change into this realm consisting of, like, rusted metal and grating and platforms. What was once the quaint town is now an area covered in blood, rust, and mutilated corpses. And Harry is then attacked by a swarm of child-sized creatures and awakens in a cafe in the very normal-looking Silent Hill. From here, Harry must now explore the town and discover what happened to Cheryl. Along the way, he does encounter a few other humans, such as a police officer named Sybil Bennett, a guy named Michael Kaufman, and the mysterious Dahlia Gillespie. He also encounters a wide variety of creatures, uh, such as flying beasts and human-like monsters. Beyond the monsters in the town, you will also enter the other world, which is this rust-covered dimension, as I had previously described, and it's really an alternate dimension to Silent Hill. So you'll be standing in an area in Silent Hill, you'll hear the siren, and then you'll enter the other world, and you'll be in like a reverso version of that area you just were so a good portion of silent hill at one point takes place in a school and when you go into like the other world version of the school things are twisted and so what might have been a janitor closet now has torture racks in it oh that's fun you also encounter a mysterious figure named alessa uh, who is ultimately tied to the cult that operates out of the town through story beats and various readings that you discover you do learn that alessa was the catalyst for the cursed nature of silent hill due to the abuse she suffered at the hands of the cult and her mother. You also learn that the cult is trying to force Alessa into birthing their god. Now, the game has five endings, which we're going to spoil for you because this game is old. In the show notes, I'll put in the timestamps for when the spoilers begin and end. But the game came out 22 years ago, so if you weren't interested in playing it <laughs> for 22 years, I'm sorry, you're going to get spoiled. But uh, if you are interested in playing Silent Hill before listening to this episode, go down to the show notes and check out when the spoiler starts and ends. Now, there are a scale of different endings, and starting with the good plus ending, then there is a good ending, a bad ending, a bad plus ending, and a fifth secret ending. Is bad plus bad bad, or is bad plus no, good bad? No, bad plus is good bad. So it's good bad. Yeah, bad is the worst. So it's good <laughs> plus good, bad plus bad, and then a fifth secret ending. The good plus ending is achieved if Harry completes the Michael Kaufman side quest and saves Sybil. The Kaufman side quest involves finding a substance called algolophus. 
In the Good Plus ending, Alessa and Cheryl merge. And as you learn that Cheryl was actually a figment of Alessa's soul that became a human, which is also your daughter. Once they merge, they become the Incubator, a woman clad in white who serves as one of the final bosses of the game. The Incubator expels her evil in the form of the Incubus, a horned goat-headed creature that has feathered wings and tries to kill you. It's also the male form of a succubus. When you defeat the Incubus, the Incubator gives Harry a baby and shows him Sybil and Kaufman the escape. In the escape, Kaufman is killed, but Sybil and Harry escape with the baby. Yeah, she just she just, just kind of gives you a baby. Like, she just pulls it out of nowhere and is like, here, have this baby. And Harry's like, okay, okay I'll take the baby and runs away with the baby. From his previous adopted daughter. Who's now merged with Alessa and is this, like, thing called the incubator. And, yeah, and everything's on fire and that's why you have to escape. And then she goes, go over there. Yeah, she, like, points you in a direction and she's like, go that way. And Harry's and, like, okay. And it Kaufman just dies. Yeah, yeah, he gets, he gets, yeah, he gets, he gets killed. Now, so that's good plus. Sybil and Harry escaping with this random baby. It's like the opposite of um, Labyrinth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, now, the good ending is mostly the same as the good plus ending. But if you get it, instead of the good plus ending, uh, Sybil dies. So Harry and the baby escape alone. That's really just the major difference. Everything else plays out the same, but Sybil's not there at the end. The bad plus ending occurs if you don't complete the Michael Kaufman side quest, so if you never get the substance that he asks for, but you do save Sybil. In this version of the game, after you fight the incubator, she just kind of thanks you, and Harry realizes that he has now lost his daughter, and he gets really sad, and him and Sybil escape, because, again, the place is burning to the ground. The bad ending, the bad, bad ending, I guess you could call it, is achieved if you don't save Sybil, and you don't complete the Kaufman side quest. In this ending, after you defeat the Incubator, the game cuts to Harry's body lying in the car after the accident, with blood pouring from an open wound in his head. The entire game is revealed to be happening in the mind of Harry's dying brain, caused by the severe loss of blood and failing synapses so that is the uh that is the worst version of the of the game is it was literally all the dream the secret fifth ending is called and seth are you ready for this i am ready for it it's called the ufo ending nice this is achieved if you use something called the channeling stone five times at the top of the lighthouse you'll see a group of flying saucers in the air and in an animated cutscene, not cg animated hand-drawn animations one will land and the cutscene will play out where Harry walks up to the aliens and says, have you seen Cheryl? And the aliens shoot Harry and bring him onto the ship and they fly away. Then the credits roll in a Star Wars-esque title crawl. That's beautiful. You know, yeah. that's that would have been a good tie-in for when XCOM came in. Oh yeah, that would have been great. So like Harry would be like going and then all of a sudden like the XCOM ship just like crash lands on top oh, of the, that would be fun. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the aliens and like XCOM people just storm out and just start Yeah, shooting. and then you could have a XCOM DLC where you play in Silent Hill as the map. So Silent Hill is kind of known for these secret endings. They're often called like the alien endings or the kind of like goofy endings. I think one of my favorites though is in one of the games the entire story is revealed to be taking place behind this like massive computer being controlled by a corgi playing with the controls of a giant computer. It's fun. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I found uh, Takeyoshi's resume. And on the resume, he, he was acting as the CGI director of Silent Hill. Uh, he mentioned that the game would go on to sell 2 million copies worldwide, which was pretty successful for a department that was essentially where you put the troublemakers. The successful sales volume would then go on to get the game eventually labeled greatest hits for the American PlayStation market, which essentially was what PlayStation would do with really successful games they would take and then they would re-release them as cheaper titles so that they could get more volume on the same game that they previously got. So if you just waited a little bit, you could get a greatest hits version of the Silent Hill and it would be cheaper. Originally, in order to qualify to be a greatest hit game, you would have had to sold 150,000 copies and been out for at least a year. That's when they kind of started back in the 90s, um, which probably would have been the same similar bar for the original Silent Hill. The amount sold has gone up over time for qualifying to become a greatest hit. And by the time PlayStation 4, they actually have now rebranded greatest hits to just be PlayStation hits. Uh, so PlayStation hits are just essentially re-released games that 
sold well at a discounted price. Interestingly enough, I was reading some reviews that were done for Silent Hill, and there was a change based on the reviews at the time and the reviews now, or more recently. Though there was a review that came out when it was released where they were talking about how Silent Hill actually took advantage of one of PlayStation's greatest weakness, which was its draw distance deficiency. So the original PlayStation wasn't good at rendering stuff at a at distance. Uh, it would become foggy and dark, which Silent Hill just took and used it as an advantage. They just made their games foggy and dark, adding the atmosphere to the game. I did read other reviews at the time, though, where many of them would state that Silent Hill was just a Resident Evil clone. Uh, it had the same camera fixture. It was still kind of horror. Uh, They're like, yeah, it's a well-done Resident Evil clone. Now, in retrospect, reviewers are going back and saying, you know, actually, Silent Hill is actually a really ethereally interesting game. Like, it's mentally and it's different than Resident Evil. I think Resident Evil is more of a a shock horror where Silent Hill is more of a, a, a mind horror. And... I think that shows now with them looking back to the point where a number of reviews that were done in the 2000s would put the original Silent Hill actually down as one of the four, top 14 or 15 game for the PlayStation. And in 2012, Time Magazine would go on to rate it as one of the 100th greatest video games of all time. Yeah, I think it's a good point that you make that Silent Hill is more of like a mind horror because that definitely plays more into the later games. Um, I think the first game has its psychological horror elements, but in the later games especially, um, they really try to tie the horrors of Silent Hill into the character you're playing in. So, for example, in Silent Hill 2, you play as a guy named James, and it's heavily inferred throughout the game that the only reason you're seeing these horrors is because of who James is as a person. So, if anyone else was in Silent Hill besides James, they wouldn't see the things that James sees, because what James is seeing is his inner demons. Um, which I think Silent Hill does differently versus Resident Evil, where Resident Evil, you're just literally fighting zombies so like right. it, it's it is a this is a zombie apocalypse everyone sees zombies in terms of the legacy silent hill not only spawned more games in its series but also a franchise of other media the first sequel silent hill 2 came out in 2001 silent hill 3 came out in 2003 and in silent hill 3 you actually play as heather mason who is the baby that Harry Mason saves at the good plus ending of Silent Hill. Or rather, the good ending of Silent Hill, because I think Sybil is canonically dead in, in Silent Hill 3. So yeah, Silent Hill 3 came out in 2003. Silent Hill 4 came out in 2004. A prequel called Silent Hill Origins came out in 2007. Another game called Homecoming in 2008. A reimagining of the first game called Shattered Memories in 2009. And the last game in the Silent Hill series is called called Downpour, and that came out in 2012. There are also various spin-off titles, uh, such as Silent Hill The Arcade, and a mobile game called Silent Hill The Escape. Uh, there was also a Game Boy Advance Japanese-exclusive visual novel adaptation of the first game, which I always find fascinating to me. It is like the full first game, but told entirely as a visual novel, so you just read everything that happens and there is zero gameplay. Now, beyond the released games, there was also a re reimagining that was planned called Silent Hills, but it was ultimately canceled. The reimagining would have been produced by Metal Gear Solid creator Hideo Kojima and film director Guillermo del Toro and star Norman Reedus. And the creature designs were actually going to be created by Junji Ito, who was a horror manga writer. The game was canceled because Kojima had a falling out with Konami. And that is a whole thing for another day. Actually, we did kind of touch upon that when we had uh, Matt, Super Games Bro, on and we did a Metal Gear Solid episode. The demo for Silent Hills was available for a period of time under the name PT for playable teaser. It was actually kind of like a secret demo for Silent Hills because you had to unlock the teaser for Silent Hills, like the title at the very end. You had to do a specific thing to get the teaser that says, you know, Silent Hills coming soon to appear. Ultimately, though, PT was delisted following the cancellation and has not been put back on the PlayStation 4. And it's actually unable to be played on PS5. So even if you had a way of getting it on your PS5, the PS5 
legitimately just prevents it from being played. Outside of the games, there were also two films that were produced, Silent Hill and Silent Hill Revelation, uh, which loosely adapt the first three games. Silent Hill, the first movie, is kind of more of a combination of Silent Hill 1 and 2, and Silent Hill Revelation is more of just an adaptation of Silent Hill 3. The story of Silent Hill in these movies is ultimately different than the games. The location itself is changed from being a town in Maine to being a mining town in West Virginia, and the mining town has become abandoned due to a coal fire that started underground, uh, very similar to Centralia in Pennsylvania, which is a real place that was abandoned due to a coal fire. I know sometimes you'll see articles that will be like, this is the real Silent Hill, and we'll talk about Centralia. They're referring to Silent Hill from the movie, not Silent Hill from the game. The game is a resort town that does not have any mining history. Um, and there's actually a lot of lore about the game town. Like they'll have like details on when the colonists arrived in the area and started settling Silent Hill. So if you ever see an article that says this is the real Silent Hill and it talks about Centralia, know for a classic gaming brothers fact that they're referring to movie Silent Hill, not video game Silent Hill. If you want to go to real video game Silent Hill, you could probably go to like Bar Harbor because that's a resort town. <laughs> I guess I don't know if it's a fun fact, but a fact about Centralia is uh, in 2017, there are five people that were living there. There were a thousand people that were living there in 1980, but now five. And uh, the coal mine fire that's been burning, because you can say like, oh, well, why did they evacuate because of a coal mine fire? Well, you see, this coal mine fire has been burning since 1962. And it's still burning today. Yes, and uh, when coal burns, sometimes it puts out things that are not good for your body. Right, and coal's, is, coal's also very good at burning. <laughs> yeah, forever. So that is why, because there's a town in Pennsylvania that just has a, a mine that's a, a coal fire that's been going on since probably many of us were born. So. <laughs> if you were born before the coal fire in Centralia, send us, a, send us an email and we will send you a free video game. Anyway, that is our Silent Hill episode. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I think Silent Hill is a fascinating series um, and I would love to talk more about it, but not tonight. Not today. Uh, today we're going to move on to the byway pass segment so uh for the byway pass segment zach i'm gonna open it up here so uh this game is a open world survival game it uh takes place in a post-pandemic america Uh oh except this pandemic was a zombie pandemic and so you have to survive in this zombie world are you interested yes i am it's the day before by fantastic I almost picked this game for you. We are going to be right back as I take a look at this game. All right, and we're back. So The Day Before is a game being developed by Fantastic, I think, and published by Mytona uh, and due out June 21st, 2022. It is an MMO open ar- open world survival um, set in this uh, zombie world. I have mixed MMO feelings. You see, I like playing MMOs, but I only like playing MMOs with people I know. And I only like playing MMOs that I can be silly in. I- and I have to have like a specific need to play an MMO. Like, I don't know how to describe it, but I I don't, like, want to play an MMO every day. Like, I might want to play an MMO once a, a, a year. <laughs> like, period. <laughs> like, for a, for a few hours. Star Wars. Yeah. Like, like Star Wars, uh, The Old Republic, or Star Trek Online. Like, I'll play it for a few hours every year or so. My thing with MMOs is that I like playing video games, and I like playing video games with people I know, but I don't like playing video games with people I don't know, or that I have to rely on people I don't know. And that's one of the major problems I've had with games like The Division or uh, Destiny where I, you can play them by yourself or you can play them with people you know, but if you are just looking to play the game sometimes by yourself, it's often not recommended. A lot of times the levels are geared toward finding parties. And if you don't have friends that play the game and you don't really want to team up with people you don't know, it just might not be a good time. So that's personally been my experience with playing games like this. I really try to stray away from them. So I'm going to put this down as a pass, uh, which is unfortunate because it does look like a cool game. It does look very fun 
in terms of the actual gameplay. Though it does actually kind of remind me of The Division, which I had mixed feelings of anyway. But yeah, I'm going to put this down as a pass just because if it wasn't an MMO, if this was just a uh, standard, um, you know, open world game that you could maybe play with people uh, with like an online option, I would be interested. But yeah, I'm going to I'm going to put this down as a pass. Are you ready for your byway pass? I am. So this game is an atmospheric sci-fi adventure taking you on a suspense-fueled high-stakes mission to recover colony ships that were stolen by the mysterious Outward. Which I don't know what that is, but it sounds sounds spooky. This is a game being developed by Kyokin Interactive and published by Frontier Foundry. It is coming soon and it's set on a planet that's in the solar system that's not Earth. Are you interested? Uh, sure. This is Deliver Us Mars. We'll be right back as Seth looks up Deliver Us Mars. And we're back. So Deliver Us Mars is actually the sequel to Deliver Us the Moon, which is a game that I already own and have not been able to get into. So I don't know if I'm going to put... I'm going to say this. I'm going to try and play and get into Deliver Us the Moon, since apparently it's award-winning. And if I can get into it and enjoy it, then I will buy Deliver Us Mars. If I can't, I will pass. Fair enough. I think I think I'm gonna put it down right now as a pass, but uh that's contingent on my going back and playing Deliver Us the Moon, which is a game that I mean I should like. It kinda hits those things that I like, but uh I just I haven't been able to get into it. Uh anyway, that will do it for today's episode. Um, if you enjoyed the episode, let us know. You can email us at classicgamingbrothers at gmail.com. You can also visit our website, classicgamingbrothers.com. Visit our Facebook, Classic Gaming Brothers, our Twitch, Classic Gaming Brothers, our Instagram, Classic Gaming Brothers, and lastly, our Twitter, CG Brothers Pod. Be sure to like, subscribe, do all those things that you could do to let us know that you like us. And um, also be sure to follow us on any of the podcasting applications out there and rate us as you would. Uh, you know, five stars, always nice. Uh, let us know you like like the podcast that's always appreciated uh, anyway that's all that i have um i'm pretty sure that's everything so i'm just going to end things off i don't think seth has anything else to add unless he does don't play games like my brother and don't play games like my brother i've been seth and i've been zach and we've been the classic gaming brothers that's right head is a spooky spooky